Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here today with Gemma Sugru of Pro Vocal Artist. And I met Gemma recently um, through, well, through a program that we're both in and through a mutual friend. And I just have loved getting to know her. And I wanted to get you guys to get to know her because she's got so much experience as um, a teacher of, of voice and now really training artists in how to have a unique sound and also work with their artist identity and their branding. And uh, also she is trained in uh, tiny habits, which I'm excited to talk about too, because that's something that I'm very interested in, in helping musicians with as far as becoming more productive. So we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, but before we get into all that, I would just love to know a little bit about your background, Gemma. Let us know kind of your story and, and how you ended up where you are today. Okay, well, how I got here, it's been, uh, I started singing in school, you know, I was told it was something I was good at. And then I was like, Oh, great, I'm good at something. Okay, let's do that more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're like looking for your thing when you're younger, I was like, Oh, that's gonna be my thing. Brilliant. And so I did and I adored my first singing teacher. I thought she was amazing. I would do anything she'd say. And she thought I was going to be a famous opera singer. And I was like, Yes, I agree. Let's do that. And <laughs> so I went off and studied classical. I trained um, for seven years singing opera and that kind of stuff. And then and I ended up coming out of that. I, I set up a business with my friend um, called Voiceworks Studio. We ran that for 10 years. It was a singing school in Ireland and we had a couple of locations and loads of singers coming in and lots of teachers and it put on big outdoor events and shows and it was great fun. And But a lot of those singers were coming to me to learn uh, pop music and I was like, oh gosh, I've only ever sung in this way. So I had to go and figure that out for myself and I started traveling to different conferences around the world trying to figure out how am I going to convert my voice from classical to more of a contemporary style and so I got really interested in voice science um, and I yeah I went down that rabbit hole I came back then to teach my students then I ended up getting picked up for gigs to do though like there was I think in Ireland there was one particular gig where they needed a singer to work with an orchestra where everything was very scored but all of the songs were pop songs and they were like Gem is a classical and now she's a pop singer so she's the perfect person for that and I always in in my degree was that was a dream to sing with like a professional orchestra and once I pivoted from classical I was like oh I'll never get my dream and I was like oh I got my dream it was just a different way okay cool <laughs> And so I was doing that and then I, uh, I've been, you know, vocal, got really into vocal coaching and helping singers and, and a lot of the time I'd work with artists and, and you know yourself, well, if, with, with music teaching, you kind of, you end up being more holistic than you probably anticipated you would be. Like you're kind of their therapist and you're kind of encouraging them and you're kind of their manager and you're kind of the, you know, and I wasn't like pushing it on them, but it was always, they would kind of, we'd end up in those conversations, I'd end up helping them outside of the, the voice stuff so then I ended up selling my business my school um last year and I decided to set up a, an online program called pro vocal artists that would help them in that holistic way so that's where I am right now and and that has brought me to you that, that makes a lot of sense I love how you said that we have to you know be their therapist and all that yeah, I definitely remember I have never taught voice outside of you know having to teach it in vocal technique needs vocal techniques in class, you know, in college, but uh, definitely remember kind of having to help the students I was working with, with that, because there's a lot of mindset around voice as well as then, of course, getting into the, like, how do you make money with this thing, right? Mm -hmm. As an artist, um, did you, when you were 
first, you know, working with voice students, were most of them um, wanting to become artists and make money from it, or were a lot of them hobby singers? Well, I had, so it was my school. So, and there were other, lots of other singing teachers. Mm. So anytime a singer that came, came in, who was very serious and was going to turn this into a career, I was like, that's my one. <laughs> I'll have him. I'll have her. And so I'm like, look, if I get a privilege, this is my privilege that I get for having the school. So I got to work with all these really committed, serious singers. And I, like, I've always been good, I think, with personal brand and pushing myself on, not that I'm pushing myself but like I actually really enjoy social media I used to be on snapchat all the time and then I got into tiktok I, I like all of that stuff so I loved helping them create their artist brand help them figure out actually let's turn this into a, a legit career um I've t I've talked a parent out of um I've, I've talked a parent around to uh, her son not continuing his degree in flute which he had at the royal academy in London he had full scholarship and I sat down and I was just like they he doesn't want like I knew he didn't want to do it I'm good friends with his mom it was okay but he, I brought him to a, he, I was doing a program in LA called Vocalize You which is amazing which is an artist retreat he um, went to that and he was like right no this is ac actually absolutely what I have to do and um, he came back to London he dropped out of his degree he ended up like couch surfing for a while Um, his mom was like oh my goodness but he was hell bent on it um, and I was very much yes 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 and now he's like I think actually currently he's two songs in the in the charts right now and he's you know on the Saturday, Jimmy Fallon a few weeks ago and he's everything is flying high for him so well, that's exciting so who is this is this someone we've heard of yeah he, his name is Keen DeCrow so he's fantastic on TikTok he's brilliant at promoting himself on TikTok and he's yeah he's doing really really well at the moment wow that's awesome well mm -hmm. I have definitely started following you on TikTok and um I love I just love how you uh, put your personality out there and it's I think that that's I know for me, like that's a little bit of where I'm, I'm struggling or a little uncomfortable of like just fully putting my personality out there. So is that just natural to you or is that something that you've, you've developed on social media? I think I was lucky because I started on Snapchat years mm. ago and all of my like most of my students they were either teens or kids in the school and they were all using Snapchat at the time so I knew that nobody was really watching me on that app other than the kids and the teens uh, and I would kind of just be that person that I would be with them and I'd be wearing filters and just having a laugh and I didn't have that pressure of it going out to like you know serious people and so when it when it came around that Instagram took on stories I had already like built up a like I, I was already well practiced without mm. the um what is the, the the stakes weren't very high for me in right. snapchat so I got to just it became natural so then by the time stories came around I was like on the phone and, and totally fine but I I also think that it's probably a little bit part of my you know I'm a performer I think that there's something in me as well that like you know like showing off <laughs> Yeah, no, you're really good at being like flippant and silly and stuff like that, that doesn't necessarily come natural to me. Um, uh -huh. So I've been watching you going, okay, how can I add a little bit of this to what I'm doing? <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone has their, you know, it, it, I, I like to think about it like you have all these, like on a mixing desk, you have all these different dials on your personality mm. and you're just going to turn one of those dials up. So you're just amplifying one part of you um, because I know some people are like, I don't want to be phony. That's not really me, but I'm like, there are aspects of you that are silly and that are a bit, you know, wacky or whatever you may want to be on that platform that you can just start dialing up a little bit. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So how do you, um, cause I know that this does also relate to like branding and artist identity and stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you help artists to kind of dial up the right dials for them when they are on, on social platforms? Yeah. So I, I like, and the reason why I love doing pro vocal artists is because of the holistic approach. And I know that you take this approach as well with your students is to, um, like, how does everything come together with one vision and how, like, can we get behind that with the whys and the values and the, the, the vision for everything and, and have a very strong perspective and feel very like integrous with all of that. Um, and that social media then just feels like an extension to that core 
core vision that you have. And it's just an extension of your creativity. It's not this thing that you have to, you know, a chore that you have to push out to the world. Also get them to flip the mindset on it. Because some, I actually think that the big resistance with social media is that you feel like you're just taking, you know, you're just like, hmm. please listen to my song, please watch my thing, please buy my course. And nobody feels good doing that. And so I, I, I get people to think like, you're just sharing excitement. This is like, for me, it's like, I like, I have to offload excitement. I get too excited. I have to put it somewhere. <laughs> so I have to put it on this camera right now. Otherwise I, I can't relax. So I have to put my enthusiasm for this gig. I have to put my enthusiasm out for this thing that I'm doing. And I just like communicating about it. And I'm hopefully inspiring or making other people uplifted with, with what I'm talking about. And so you're always feeling like you're adding and giving and, and yeah, adding value and, and that little mind mindset switch with that alongside the kind of the bigger picture of the whole brand and the the why and the the, the main message yeah no I, I think that's absolutely right I think artists do have a hard time not that they're not excited about their stuff but they have a hard time showing that excitement yes because they're worried that that's somehow gonna like be too self-promoting or something like that yes <clears throat> totally I know and it's like um I don't know so an another idea that I try to get them to take on board is that importance of self-validation mm -hmm. um that we're like we have to be self-validated first because our job is to serve our job is as performers our job is to get on stage and give the audience a good time and if I'm really busy going I hope you get that high note. Do you know the lyrics? I hope mm. they like this. Then I'm not in a position to be able to serve everybody. So like that they have to kind of put on their own oxygen mask first and always think about it as, as a service. But I, I, it, it takes a bit of time to, to get around that mindset. All right. Yeah, no, very much true. And like you said, if you are preoccupied with, oh my gosh, am I going to hit this or you know, have I practiced enough or do I know the words or whatever it is, um, yeah. it's going to take away from the, the performance and, you know, the way that you come across and, and it's going to not get the audience as excited as, as you want them to be as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I wanted to ask about um, kind of that, that, that thing that um, everybody has, it's kind of their signature vocal you know not one thing but like you know we have these different things that are kind of like inherent in our own voice and how do you how do you identify that in an artist and then help them kind of amplify that because I've had this conversation with other um, vocal teachers especially those that teach in the classical world and you know another guest that I had she was talking about how in the classical world, we're kind of trying to make people more uniform. We're trying to, to help them to sound a certain way. Whereas then when we get into kind of the pop world, we're trying to amplify that thing that's that's different and unique about the person's voice. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and some of that may be actually, maybe using some techniques that in, in the classical world would be very much frowned upon, you know, like vocal fry and stuff like that. Yes. Totally. Yeah. I think that there's, there's one idea is to think about it on a spectrum. And so let's say 10 is perfect vocal health, right? So this perfect vocal technique nailed it. Right. And then one is outrageously artistic and probably going to put your voice into jeopardy. Right. If you do mm. it, if you only sing in that way all of the time and artists have to find their place throughout a song on this spectrum. And there are little choices that they'd make if they like, if you always do a, a uh, sound I see you drive around town if you're always on setting with the uh, sound that's like the vocal folds going like that mm. if you're if you're very habitual about doing that you will fatigue the voice quicker than if you sang ah uh, I um without the glottal on set so that's like one example so, so that's one thing but if, yeah finding that place and choosing your moments where you're like you know what I am going to dial things up a little bit here I am you know I, I am going to kind of lean into the sound a bit more I'm going to belt it a bit more 
Um, but yeah, the, the second thing is like how I like to help singers find their, their signature sound. Um, one of the ways is to opt for primal sounds rather than like stylistic sounds. So I'm like, well, what's the sound that you make if you were calling your friend and you would go, Hey, yeah, whoa. Or, you know, what, where does your voice sit in the most natural impulsive, like, Oh my God. Yay. So exciting. (laughs) What does it do when you say that, you know, and they're just very emotion direct to voice sound. And rather than, oh, I want to sound like a, and I have this cool voice and I'm going to be in the style of the whatever pop artists are doing right now, because that's not, even though that's a unique ish sounding thing, it's just kind of a trendy thing. And so we've got to find like what's very, you know, normal and natural for you firstly. And then uh, like, secondly, I think that if there are limitations in the voice, we have a decision to make about whether or not we iron it out. Now, I think you can iron it out for sure, but we always want to make sure that we like maybe create it as an option. So anytime I'm adding something or changing something in a voice, I always say, I'm just adding another lane to your voice. I don't expect you to always drive in this lane, but this is a new lane that you have as an option. Um, But also know that your limitations are actually like the the flow flaws are the beauty because the flaws also encourage you to be creative and find a creative workaround. So if you can't perfectly blend through the bridge of your voice, you're going to come up with some cool flip thing that happens every time there. And that's really interesting to hear. So know that that's going to give birth to something creative. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think that is important to like amplify that thing. Like you said, that flip sometimes or No, there's like a difference between that and like, actually, you're really having trouble negotiating going from, you know, your chest voice to your, to your head voice, and you're struggling versus, you know, so how do you determine whether it's struggling or whether it's just like a a natural thing that happens and you want to amplify that because that's unique? Yeah, I think that there's like a basic functionality of the voice we need to establish. So there are different vibratory patterns that occur in the voice. There are four vibratory patterns and the one that we're most, the the two that we're most familiar with are mode one and mode two. So mode one is what I'm speaking in right now. And if I was to, hey, it would be like my thicker sound. And then mode two is a falsetto sound. Hey. We need to access pure functionality in both of those modes to be able to really sing anything. Um, And then it comes to like transitioning the voice or bridging the voice and making sure that those two don't sound like that there's an abrupt change between them. Mm -hmm. How far you dive into that is up to you because there are singers who have blended themselves into no return like it's completely (laughs) ironed out and and it's very hard for them to do anything that's like quite like a a yodel or anything contrasting like that so it's up to them how much how far they and like a classical singer they they will train their up their head voice all the way down and it's Mm -hmm. very hard for them to access the chest register that almost kind that that muscle almost atrophies um and and the other one is just much more um agile and, and available so you know, the more you do something, the more you're going to be doing that or wired to do that. So you have to make choices with that. But I think to really simply answer your question, I, you know, you always want to make sure that something that's cool and quirky is feels much more like a, a, a choice rather than a, a crutch or a default that that sounds a little bit like unstable. We want to find stability mm-hmm. in those things we're accessing. Yeah, no, I remember, you know, when I was training as a classical singer in the early 90s, and I would hear someone on the radio and like they would, they would be breathy, like in their, you know, when they go into their head voice, they would be breathy. And I would be like, they never train, you know, they never trained their head voice. But now I'm thinking, well, maybe they did that on purpose. Like maybe that was their style that they wanted to like go from their chest voice to being breathy. Yeah, but maybe not. Maybe that was just their voice and they hadn't trained that part of their range. Yes, totally. And I'm often because because like head voice is kind of like produced or well-trained falsetto. Mm -hmm. And I'm often trying to train back the falsetto because the falsetto is the most is the the kind of basic function of that sound. Mm -hmm. And, And sometimes singers have gone so far into their training that they can't access the raw function, functional sound of falsetto anymore. Mm. 
Interesting. I, I, I love what you said about, you know, having this like kind of like bag of bag of things that you can do or, you know, like lanes or whatever that you can drive in with your voice and that you can make those choices. And the point is you can make a choice. Like if you haven't trained your voice, then you're, you're just going to do whatever your voice does and you aren't making a choice about it. Mm -hmm. And so what you're helping them say is like, okay, these are, here's some unique things that you do with your voice, but you don't want to do these all the time because they're not necessarily good for your voice. You also don't want to pigeonhole yourself into sounding this way constantly. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw your TikTok, you know, where you were kind of like doing an example of like Britney Spears and how she does a little bit of vocal fry and stuff like that. And yeah, that's like her unique style. It kind of irritates me, but because I don't, I don't necessarily love the way that she sings, but like, uh-huh. it's very much her style. Right. And, yeah. you know, I, my question was always, well, is she making those choices or is that just how she sings all the time? I don't know. I, f- I feel like that was encouraged in production with probably like, I, I or like you know maybe they could hear they they heard it on one t- and they're like oh my god that that is a thing keep mm-hmm. doing more of that and they ramped it up a lot more um but like vo- a lot of people would pr- would think that vocal fry is, is quite bad for you um it, it I kind of equate it because I use it as a technical thing and speech therapists use it as a technical thing because it habituates the vocal folds in a certain way that's helpful for certain techniques or uh, like to help us uh, create certain air pressure under the vocal folds mm-hmm. but like it's but if you were to do it all the time, so if I was like always talking like Kim Kardashian there, <laughs> then it would say it's, it's like having two legs to walk with, but you, but you decide to limp, mm. you know, you're, you're not actually using it. It's typically meant to be used and that it can be used. Mm. Mm. That's cool. That's cool. So how, how do you help artists tie in like their special, unique vocal abilities and sounds to like their overall brand. Yeah, so we do some, uh, like it's pulling together a couple of different, and I see this as like four categories that we can think about. So the first category would be charisma and understanding what is your charisma? Like, are you the the funny person? Mm -hmm. Are you that very connecting, like look into your eyes, ask you like, was it, was this because your mother felt, made you feel like this when you were a child kind of person? You know, like the Oprah Winfrey's, are you like, uh, you know, come in big high energy? Are you somebody who's like, oh, I wanna know more about them, they're very mysterious. So just identifying what's your inner power, your charisma, definitely what's your perspective? Like what's your, what do you stand for? What's your, and, and I do psychometric tests with them as in get them to do a psychometric test like the Myers-Briggs. Uh-huh. I don't, yeah, so that could be interesting. And we do some kind of questions to take that data and then use it for the artistry. But I, I let them know that like those tests, especially something like Myers-Briggs, it's essentially a preference test rather than a personality test. It's letting you know what you think, who you think you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and But it's bringing it back to you in, in words that maybe you weren't able to articulate and um, they can really start uh, pulling together a story with that. Um, also looking at their, their taste, I think coming up with uh, going back in time and looking at like, well, what was the song you just couldn't stop singing when you first learned to sing? What's the one Mm. you sang over and over and over again, and then analyze what it was about that song and then find other artists that they really aspire to sound like, because they're the very formative years when you have the most, most neuroplasticity up until you're 25. A lot of that is getting wired into the vocal tract and into the sound of the artist. Um, and, and, you know, some of it could be quite subconscious to them. And so analyzing that, finding the commonalities between those different artists. Um, some other exercises we do are like figuring out who are you as a private person? Who are you as a public person? And who are you in your music? And like for me, I know that I figured out I was hiding in my music. I would always go for like, I wanted to sing jazz. I wanted to sing hard stuff. I wanted to sing. I was a bit more metaphorical in my lyric and I'm like, that's not me I'm actually very straightforward Mm -hmm. you know you kind of I'm I'm very direct and I was like why am I being so indirect in my music this is not doesn't line up and so those exercises can be super helpful for tying it all together um so yeah charisma and the musical taste musical direction and like your taste and everything like what's my taste in sound design my arrangement and vocal aesthetic and everything like that and then your vocal identity um and then your your image 
so like how do you what visuals are you drawn to and what visuals are going to kind of paint the picture and tell the story yes all very very important did you do you ever find it that this is kind of what happened to me I think um that I had like certain vocal tastes or like, you know, interests. And like, I was very interested in like Lilith Fair style artists and and singer songwriter and all of that. Um, But I found that when I would go to like write and, and come up with something that was like from myself as an artist, I would actually write more like a Amy Grant or something like that, because that's what I grew up with. And it was like, I wanted to be this particular artist, this particular style that I really loved and really admired and really enjoyed listening to. But what came out of me was not that. Yeah. (laughs) So like, what do you do when the thing that you want to be is not actually what's happening for you? Yeah. I, I, and what is it that you didn't like about what, what was coming out? I mean, I think it just, it wasn't it wasn't the direction that I wanted to go. I think it was, it was a little more in the past versus what I was wanting to do that I felt like was a little more current, Mm -hmm. but I think because I grew up in that era and you know, that's what I listened to for so long. Like that was just what came out. Yeah. I think, um, like, see, I'm, I'm taking this from my experience of helping a singer with creative covers. And I'm, I, I usually direct them to, to go like, what, what's shiny about that particularly, specifically for you, that song? And then how can we rewrite this or kind of remake this song to make sure that everybody knows what's, what you think is shiny about it? So whether that's like the, the way the harmony works, uh, the, a particular lyric, a particular point in the mel- melodic structure, um and so i suppose my suggestion with that would be to find be very specific about what it was that was standing out to you as shiny and that you were and what were you already aware of that specifically yeah i mean i think so i yeah. think so i think i just for whatever reason when i went to write that's just not what came out <laughs> You know, and I could have just decided, well, I'm going to do these kind of songs anyway. And, I'm, and you know, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to do them as covers. And I did do that actually, but it always yeah. frustrated me that like, when I actually went to write as an artist, that's not what came out, even though that's what I really loved. Yes. Did, do you always, what do you always start with or do you change it up? Do you always start with chords? Do you always yeah, I think that was actually part of the problem too. So I mean, I haven't been, haven't had time to write a lot lately, but for sure, I was very stuck in the, you know, writing from chords, probably. Yeah. Most songs I've always started with writing from chords and then piano based and stuff. Um, And a lot of the people that I looked up to were writing from guitar. Mm -hmm, Right. Right. So it it could be like, yeah, sometimes that interrupting the pattern of how you always do it Mm -hmm. to see. and, And I think creating a lot of limitation around the composition so like that if you're just trying to if that the the style you're going for always uses this change in the chord structure you have to use that change or you have to pull it you know just some kind of limitation or boundary or or like exercise and but I do think the like starting with just drums or starting with just vocals can be the pattern interrupt that you need Mm -hmm. yeah I like that um Okay, so let's switch gears and let's talk about like habits and and time management and that kind of thing. So first of all, what is a tiny habits coach? A tiny habits coach is somebody who took Zoom calls with uh, BJ Fogg's sister, Linda, uh-huh. for, uh, in 2020 um, and thought it was great. <laughs> what what and- made you want to go into that? Um, I just, I suppose it was kind of like lockdown fever. Mm. I just got really into um, like Andrew Huberman, who's a, he's got a podcast. He's a, an ophthalmologist, but he's really into helping people with productivity and hacking their circadian rhythm and all of that. And I started mm. getting really routined about everything I was doing and I wanted to make the most out of my time. And yeah, I just, I, it really appeals to me, but I also, and like everything in my life, I'm always looking for like the double benefit. And I'm like, oh my God, like if ever I feel, and the thing that keeps me up at night is always, oh, I don't know if I'm a, if I'm good enough, if I've helped 
the singer enough if I'm mm. a good enough coach if they think oh that I thought that would be better and I and I felt like the the thing I used to always fall down on as a one-on-one -on -one coach was that we'd circle back a little bit every week you know we kind of there wasn't that much traction I thought there would mm. be way more traction and they'd be like oh I things. totally get where you're yeah I totally get that and that's actually one reason that I don't do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching because it's frustrating as a coach right yeah. And it, and it's hard not to think that it's you. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard for both of you to have the exact same conversation that like, oh, you know, this week, it just, the day flew by and da, da, da. And I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm, you know, no judgment. I totally get it. Life is busy, but I was going, well, how do I help here? How do I make this better? What way can I assist? And I was like, if I actually was trained in habits, this is how I can make this problem go away. Mm. And so I just started getting really into it and, um, yeah, it was cool. And I would get really micro then with the singers I was working with, uh, I would give them a heads up. Like anyone who was coming into work with me, I was just like, this is the way I work. Um, now we started doing it as part of my pro vocal artist program and they would have been very aware that that was the whole like foundation of it. It was like, I need to set up the foundation of your life to support what we're going to do because you're basically you're like a startup CEO if you're doing this artistry thing um, and there's going to be some sacrifices that need to be made because you're going to have a family you're going to have a life you're going to have a job and we have to do this artistry thing as well and the only way this is going to do we've got to win this game by consistency not like the urgency or the intensity and we have to have a, a locked down routine for this. So that's, that was very motivating for us. I love that. And I am all about that for sure. I have found the artists that I work with. That's like one of the biggest thing that makes a difference for them. Yeah. You know, they come back to me and like, I think I've given them all these great ideas for this and that and booking and fans and all. And I have, but like really what they come back to me, like what really stuck with me is like, getting my life in order and setting up habits and time management skills and all of that stuff. Um, and it's true because if you don't have that stuff, then you can't really utilize what you're learning in the other areas because you're just kind of all over the place and a little, you just get overwhelmed so easily. Totally. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's the <clears throat> everything will flow like all the good cascades from that solid uh, routine and ritual. And like one of one of the many important things I learned from BJ Fogg and his teachings was that focus on the habit set up rather than the habit itself. Don't worry too much at the beginning about like the actual action you're trying to take. Just be very preoccupied about the design of the habit. Um, and once you design the habit properly, then the, in, the action within it is going to grow and thrive. Can you give an example of that? Yeah. So you, he has a formula, um, which he has, he, he has, he calls it a recipe. So you want an anchor, which is, um, an action that already exists in your life or, um, yes, yeah, so something that you already do. So maybe you always have a cup of coffee in the morning. And so you will say, after I have a cup of coffee, I will and then he uh, gets you to be specific about what you're going to do next so you know is there going to be a starter step do you need to turn on the keyboard do you need to like really map out all of the details so there's very little friction to doing the thing um because you know you could be just about to do it and then you can't find the lead and oh the, somebody's going to get up now and maybe this isn't the right time and you haven't really planned it out properly so getting quite micro about the detail so after I have a cup of coffee I will switch on the keyboard and do 10 minutes of vocal warm-ups um and then I will and his final part of the recipe is he was like most habits are formed through emotion like it doesn't take you long to have a Instagram scrolling habit because there is plenty of dopamine being kicked off in the brain mm -hmm. that makes you want to open it again and again and again so you need to help yourself have that pleasurable experience with the habit that you're trying to create so you celebrate it you can do something like a, an outward in thing where you like do something physical because if you do like if you think about what do you always or if you were to throw a tea bag I don't know if you have tea and um, but if you threw a tea bag across the room in, and it landed in the cup what action would you take what would you do as a response um I would I don't know I would drink tea <laughs> <laughs> how would you celebrate it um 
you got it. It was really far away now. The cup was ages away and you threw it and it landed in. Would you be like, yes. I would be giving myself high fives. Totally. (laughs) So there's something that you might do physically like, yes, or oh yeah, or woohoo, or you might do a little dance or Mm. there's something you would do physically that would celebrate that little moment. And if you did that physically, like not even without feeling it directly after you've done the practice, it starts to wire in this positive uh, association with what you're doing. Another thing that I borrowed from like Marissa Peer is, um, you know, self praise and, and kind of being your own coach and your own cheerleader in your mind, reminding yourself why you're doing this, why this is good, well done, keep going, all of that, that that can be really helpful. So yeah, but I, what I would advise for somebody who's really starting off trying to build up a habit is to not actually play or say, that it's, let's say they're sitting down to play piano for 10 minutes don't actually play the piano for 10 minutes or play the piano for one minute and make yourself stop. I Mm -hmm. I want you to get hungry for it. I want you to be like, oh, I want to keep going. No, stop. Next day you do one minute and you do one minute for the whole week and then you build it up to five, you build it up to seven. um, And then so that you're focused on developing the habit rather than the habit itself. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely utilized this in relation to like trying to get myself to write music, right? you, you spend five, you do five minutes a day or whatever, or 10 minutes a day. And you're not allowed to be going beyond that, even though you get excited and get into it. Yes. And I always thought, wow, why are they making me stop? You know, but I like that idea that you're, you get hungry for it. Yeah, totally. And, and that, that routine is getting established and soon you'll drink the coffee and you're craving the next step, which is to go over and turn on. It's almost like a a zombie walking over. It's like a Pavlovian thing. Yeah, (laughs) totally. (laughs) Totally. Um, yeah. Something I like to do is kind of attach a habit that I, I know I should do. Mm -hmm to something I really want to do. Mm. So for like example, you know, I, if I enjoy listening to podcasts, I only allow myself to listen to the podcast when I'm out on my walk. Yes. So then yeah. I'll be like, oh, I really want to go on my walk because I want to hear my podcast. And I don't allow myself to be like, well, I'm in the kitchen making breakfast. I'm just going to listen to it. Nope, nope, nope. Can't have it because yeah. then I won't want to go on my walk. I love that. I I get Brené Brown for the bathroom clean. Ah, there you go. <laughs> right? I know I used to have like one podcast that I listened to while I did the laundry. Oh, nice. Cuz then it would be like, oh, you only get to listen to this if I'm folding laundry. <laughs> yeah, totally. I was doing the laundry the other day and I had some I had like a podcast on and uh, my boyfriend came over to help me and I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. I'm, this is lovely. I'm having a lovely time." Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to run out of the laundry too fast because then I have to turn off my podcast. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And do you, um, like, how do you work with them practically around like time management? Do you encourage them to use a calendar or use a to-do list or anything like that? Yeah. Um, so we, there's a couple of strategies I like to use. I like to use plan tomorrow today. And on their check-in form, they tick a box to say, I have planned tomorrow today for how many days a week and Mm -hmm. and let me know how that's going. Uh, I think that's really important if you go to bed knowing what you're doing the next day. It's so powerful. And also like get excited about the plan that's in place for you. Like have this real reason for waking up on time and getting out of bed and getting onto that plan. Mm the, I, I like the practice of getting them to track one or two days every half hour. So like write down, like set an alarm on your watch that goes off every 30 minutes and just write down what you're doing. So you actually have an idea of where your time goes. And then we can actually reasonably see how we're going to schedule for it. Then I get them to block everything on the Google calendar. So they'll block out, this is the writing time. This is the social media time. This is the, I have to coach or I have to do some work time. Um, this is my bedtime. Um, like I think the alarm for going to bed is more important than the alarm for waking up. <laughs> I have that on my iPhone. Yeah, I totally yeah. do. 
so good I, I i absolutely live for my evening routine now and it's so precious to me um and like just getting them into the habit of like what you're seeing like getting them up early in the morning get things when they when you know it has your freshest energy is when you should be doing the thing that matters the most to you understanding what's important and what's urgent and if you don't the reason things are urgent is because you haven't planned for what's important mm-hmm. um and yeah just always weekly reviewing weekly review i think the yeah. weekly review to time process is really important just reflecting on things and seeing how things went and just iterating all the time and the google calendar is an intense blocking system and i don't expect them to get it right i don't expect them to get 100 percent, but i'm like this is the ideal week that we're always aiming for uh, and let's see how we do and, and kind of tweak it yeah we have very similar ways of doing this for sure and i'm all about google calendar because yeah. it's it's so much so easy to like manipulate you can always see it wherever you are you know Mm. Um, and so I'm a big fan of that for sure. And I love having, encouraging them to have a meeting with themselves once a week, like oh, you said, nice. yeah. you know, like on Sunday night or whatever, or Friday at the end of the week, just how did I do, you know, and not like beat yourself up, but, mm-hmm. but, but, you know, you've got to, you've, you've got to be honest with yourself. Totally. Yeah, you got to collect the data. I, I like that way you phrased it, having a meeting with yourself at the end of the week. Yep. Yep. Cool. It's it's super useful, I think. Yeah. Um, what was the other thing I was going to ask you about um, in relation to that? Shoot, it just escaped me. So, I mean, as far as the planning, like, do you encourage them to um, use any particular you know, Asana or Trello or, you know, anything in particular to help them kind of keep track of more like the the micro things that they need to do? Yeah. So all of the systems that I build for them are on Notion.so. Oh, Notion. Okay. Yeah. So Notion is kind of like a, for anyone who doesn't know about it, it's like a software that was kind of developed with med students in mind who will be taking a lot of notes within notes. So it's very flexible for somebody getting into it at first. It's like, oh my God, it's a bit too flexible. Um, but it, it has allowed me as a creator, as a, like a course creator, a program creator to create these products within it so that I'm able to get my students to just duplicate. So I've created content calendars and um, time management uh, things, tools and lots of different yeah, spreadsheets and tools and uh, boards and cool things that are all linking together. And mm. uh, they use it throughout the whole process for the year with me. So they get quite acquainted to it. Um, right. But there's, but there's definitely a bit of resistance at the beginning because I make them go on Discord on Notion and then my portal and they're like, oh, God, so many things. <laughs> but they're okay after a week or two yeah totally so you keep you keep in touch with them over discord yeah yeah i like discord um it's it's some from i i kind of like maybe i'm wrong but like i'm predicting the future like i'm kind of invested in discord i feel like it's going to be an important forum platform for artists so a place where they will like build a fan forum mm-hmm. so I'm like it's a good idea now for them to get really acquainted with this software like there are some bands like there's a, a an EDM band here in the UK who are quite big called Disclosure and their use of Discord is just like oh my god it's absolutely another level mm, wow and I think yeah as we move into like web3 and nfts i think yeah discord is is a really cool space to be in and to get used to yeah no i definitely i definitely have some artists that i work with that have done that most of them are more like streamers and you know they're used to that world right they're like twitch streamers and 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 that kind of thing and that kind of goes side by side with that at least a lot of a lot of discord people are are gamers and stuff like and streamers and stuff yeah, true that. That's another world. I'm. Uh, it's on my to do list. I yes, saying. I know you said that <laughs> Twitch was on your to do list. Yeah, <laughs> there's so many things, right? There's so many things that we we need to keep up with as people who are helping artists and wanting to make sure that they, you know, stay up to date on all this technology stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. It's finding that balance of like shiny object syndrome because mm-hmm. I love a new thing, but also, you know, trying to go, well, what do we need? What's essential? Um, where do we need to just continue attention rather than jump attention? Yep. So as far as like social media, what, what, 
do you think that there's like one place is that it's the best for artists right now or do you think they should try to be on multiple platforms um i think like horses for courses and that they're like yeah i would definitely use the disruptive platforms for introducing themselves so they can disrupt with instagram reels and they can disrupt with tiktok meaning mm -hmm. that they can somebody opens the app to have a relief from their day and they come they pop on their screen um and you're not going to get that with other types of posts on instagram other than reels um and you're going to get a great opportunity to do that on tiktok so i think if you want to introduce yourself to people get them knowing knowing about you that way so that's the introduction then nurture them by letting them into your world on your stories on instagram maybe you want to do some long form content um on maybe you want to go live i think lives are fantastic mm -hmm. lives from my uh, perspective they re because because it takes a long time for somebody to like get to like you to know you to trust you and i find that that relationship amplifies so quickly like we really go from first date to getting married on a live <laughs> and it's and it's really nice and because people are like oh you know especially like the there might be a bit of a silence or i might stumble my words people love that people mm. like to see you being a human being um so i strongly recommend artists to leverage live streaming on like instagram or tiktok i know you're you're definitely you're doing that as well aren't you yeah well i haven't done it a lot lately but i had a whole period where i did it i went live every week Cool. And I, I tell my artists like that was the best thing I ever did because number one, it got me really comfortable with going live all the time. Right. And, and of course the first ones are much more raw and hard and, you know, but also it just, it forced me to show up every yeah. week because I would be like, you know, I am doing this every Monday at noon Eastern, I'm going live. Yes. And it, it, you know, it just made it so like people were actually expecting that to happen. So I had to show up. Yeah. And that's why I really encourage artists to kind of do some kind of a, a live stream show that has some kind of frequency to it where mm. people are actually expecting you to show up. It's kind of like a podcast, right? People are expecting me to release an episode every week on Tuesday. Yeah. And if I don't, they're going to be like, what's up? What happened? And, you know, they're going to be looking for it. I know. And they're like your brilliant accountability buddies, right? <laughs> you know, getting you to do this and, and, you know, meet new people. And like, I'm I definitely hope to follow in your footsteps. I have a, a very minor podcast that I haven't really put a lot of work into, but I really admire your consistency and your commitment to it. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. And you, you've got to, you've got to love the, the medium, right? I couldn't do this if I didn't enjoy podcasting. Right. Yes. And so you have to, you know, if you're doing a live show, you've got to, you've got to organize in, in a way that you're going to enjoy. Yeah. Totally. And not make it feel like it's, it's drudgery or it's something that you have to do every week, you know, make it theme based, you know, make it fun. Right. You know, bring in cover songs. Like there's so many cool things that you can do with yes. a live show. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, what you were saying about you have to show up. And sometimes I think artists can be perfectionistic about the content that they put out. And I feel like live takes that because and then the time that they put into conceptualizing, filming, refilming, retaking. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like th those artists can really benefit from like just one live show up where they just have to show up and what goes down goes down and, and they can walk away again and that doesn't kind of soak take up their whole week because that's what puts yeah. artists off a lot is that oh my god this content creation takes so long I'm like no you're just taking so long honestly I got addicted to that it was like after after I was doing the live stream every week I was like ah. I can't, like, I don't want to spend any more. I tried to go into like creating YouTube videos and I'm like, this takes way too long. Yeah. I don't have the patience for this. Yeah. You know, I just want to like come up with what I'm going to say, you know, yeah. have, have some points and then just go out there and do it. And it was, yeah. it's so freeing. You still know you're providing value, but yeah. like you said, you're not just being all consumed by it and it's taking up so much time you do it yeah. and it's done and you can't change it and whatever happens happens and awesome you know yes, totally and people connect with the the less produced 
stuff like the stuff that's really just very honest and off the cuff yep I think so too and and I'm sticking with that because I record this podcast and I don't edit it at all because number one it would make me not want to record because then I'm like there's a whole nother slew of things I'd have to do after I was done and I would just be like dragging my feet yeah but I know that this is going to be valuable even if I'm not in there like hyper editing it yeah. So I do it because that's how I'm going to be able to produce. Oh, I, and I think that's such a brilliant uh, like thing for artists to take note of. Like, you know, the it, the things that you have in your mind about certain content, like it has to be, it has to fit the aesthetic of the wall. It has to da, 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 da. I'm like, just look at the has to be's and just see if they're really like that, that entry point is just, you've made it up and it doesn't have to be that. Like what has to be, yep. can you take away from making that content? Yep. Totally. Well, let's bring this full circle then and say, okay, if you're doing something like a live stream, how can you still make sure that it is on brand for you as an artist without being a total perfectionist about it? What, what, what are the elements that you can add to make sure that it's, it's still kind of on brand for you and it's helping you show up the way that you want to show up without having to be perfect? Yeah, well, I think, you know, feeling, feeling very, the the only, the struggle with the live thing is the, the worry about the replay Mm -hmm. Um, and just kind of, but I definitely think people need to remember that there's so much content in the world and to recall a mistake that they saw in a live stream, Right. right? they're not going to remember one and so people aren't really taking in that information and definitely not remembering that information um i i think people need to be like raw is good like we there there are clips that are famous online of like you know mobile phones at concerts that we absolutely love you know there's a lot of forgiveness around that stuff i think when it when you set it up to be this like ultimate professional slick thing um sometimes that there's like a a kind of a an uncanny there's like a valley there an uncanny valley they call it when a robot looks a a little bit too much like a human Mm. um but there's a point where it's like it gets to this tipping place where if if it's very dry and, and perfect um but there's a few slip it it doesn't fly as well so sometimes the much the more natural like just your phone and like the amp in the room um you know might be all you need i know that people would prefer something maybe a bit bit more high tech but um they they might overthink it and i I just think that mindset of like people are not going to remember if there was a mistake and all you're doing is catering to the people who are live on that call on that uh, call right there that live stream and the final thing is it's all about an energy exchange Mm. like people i know myself if i put energy in what i'm saying into what i'm doing and intention behind it i never go wrong and if your energy and your intention are with what you're doing people feel that like I'm not too woo woo, but like people feel that energy and they recognize it and they, they acknowledge it and they will resonate with it. I love that. Yes, absolutely. So true. And that is a way to make sure that you still are coming across as the artist that you want to come across on a live stream, just making sure that you've, you've, you're coming with the energy that you want to put across and that you would do in a live, you know, performance that you were in person. Yeah. And it's just be truthful. Like, you know, if something goes wrong, it could be like, oh my God, that geez, that went wrong there. I didn't think that was going to go that way. People <laughs> love that. <laughs> can I start that again? You're like, oh yeah, of course you can start that again. You know, like people love to see that you're a human being. The, I think the stress and anxiety happens when we start creating all these filters. Like, mm. I'm perfect. I have this thing planned to do. I will say only this. I look this way. Nobody will know that I have a spot on my face. Nobody will, you know, it's like just drop the filters and you will feel more relaxed. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Awesome. This has been such a great conversation. Boy, we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation. Um, Can you let everybody know how they can find you online and connect with you? Yeah, I'd love to. So you can find me on Instagram at Gemma Sugru, um, on TikTok at Gemma Sugru. Um, you can find my website, provocalartist.com. 
Um, I'm on YouTube, Gemma Sugru. Um, I have a podcast called Vocalist on Apple and all of those places. Okay, sorry. What was the name of the podcast again? It got a little bit garbled because of the internet. <laughs> oh, oh, no worries. Uh, Pro Vocal Artist. Pro Vocal Artist. Perfect. Yes. And it's just for any of you that are listening, it's a G-E-M-M-A-S-U-G-R-U-E, correct? Yes, correct. So Thank they can you. find you. Yay. Awesome. Well, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much. And I know that artists who are listening have picked up so many great tips, whether it's around vocal stuff or branding or habits. Like we covered so many things and I know artists are really going to benefit from listening to this episode. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.